All right. Hey, welcome to the program, everybody. My guest today is Terry Sr. Thanks for being here, Terry. You are a, a singer, songwriter, harmonica player, photographer, photographer, however, I don't know how you say it, but you say it. Yep. Yeah, it sums it up. I also play a little trumpet, congas, you name it. I'll probably do a little bit of it. Yeah, we were talking about that before uh, before we got started. So uh, you are, you said you're about a, a year deep in the, in the Colorado Springs music scene. When did you, what, what made you, what brought you here? Oh, I mean, I love the Colorado music scene, you know, because uh, it's been very warm and welcome to me as I've been here in the last year. People are absolutely fabulous. There's a lot of genres of music here. So it's a real pleasant surprise when you come to Colorado Springs, especially, you'll see um everything from the hip-hop to country to metal to blues i mean it, this is not a limited town so when you come through come check us out yeah so uh what what brought you here to, to colorado springs originally i know uh, strangely enough you know we have a big uh military space here my um my spouse is uh military related so we're here partly because it, um, they have one of the best areas for treat spinal treatment so he's able to get his spinal treatments here oh okay so and it really helps that it's also a great music scene so the combination really works out very well what uh what happened to his spine that he's getting treatment um you know everybody you know we get our soldiers they go over to war they fight for our freedom sometimes they don't always come back home in his right. case he didn't so right now we're taking care of the injuries and uh, i thank him and all the other soldiers out there for your service so i could be on a radio show this morning and be talking to you all absolutely um so where were you guys located before uh, colorado springs Ah, oh, you know before that i was uh living in oregon mm -hmm. and was in the oregon music scene there cool. in a small county called coos county mostly played in coos county eugene portland in a band called um, the Soul Surfers and the Road Rockers, cool. uh, mostly blues rock. And uh, the, yeah, so, so the fun. whole band name was Soul Surfers yeah, and Red yeah. Rockers. That's cool. That's they a, cool were a band. lot of fun. Is that... And I also did photography out there, and there's a lot of people out there whose photos are circulating the 101, you know, in the music scene. So 101's the that's like our 719. Yeah, well, 101's. Oh, you cool. figure you're oh, from okay, California cool. to Seattle out there whereas here we kind of do the four corners <laughs> yeah yeah four corners yeah i was born in tucson arizona so i was uh all you know all about going to the four corners physically yeah. and you know you know being like hey i'm in i'm in three different states at once or whatever you know that kind of thing and then there's so, a little catch of the story before that i lived in albuquerque new mexico for a long time cool um and did a whole different genre of music. I was in the uh, Turkish music scene. Oh, cool. With belly dance and did a lot of reenactment and friend fairs in a group called the SCA. Uh, a lot of things dealing with middle, middle evil studies. So it's a great genre of music. Belly dance, a wonderful, wonderful art. So if you ever get a chance, go out there and check it out. It is here also in uh, Colorado Springs. Oh, very cool. Yeah, um, my... My son Beaudry's mother was was in the belly dance scene for a while when we were together, and she uh, she sort of introduced me to the the, the <clears throat> excuse me the belly dancers out here, and um, you know all the different styles of belly dance and things like that that I otherwise never would have been um, able to come up with. So is is a Turkish belly dancing is that is that more the tribal style like Rachel Bryce in them, or is that more like the cabaret style? Oh, yeah. So, you know, not so much the tribal side, but I mean, uh, more of it was more of a reenactment time period of you know, showing you what that oh, was, okay. but it wasn't so much traditional. But here there's a lot more traditional stuff, mm -hmm. which is really nice. So there is a big, big history behind it. Mm -hmm. And then you have also Native American, you know, um, music. Which um, I discovered also living in the Southwest through drum circles and sure. spirituality. Oh, yeah. Yeah, you know, so anybody who gets a chance, go ahead and check these things out. Just be respectful when you're dealing with the natives. Oh, yeah. I remember, uh, you know, growing up in, in Arizona, there was, uh, there was, you know, pan flute music yeah. uh, on the radio as much as there was uh, Hispanic music, as much as there was hip hop and country and uh classic well that was, that was a lot of what went on in uh in my household my dad listened to a lot of classic right. rock my sisters listened to the modern country and, and the hip hop that was going on <clears throat> so what was your first instrument you started playing when did you start playing music <laughs> wow well, first time i ever was introduced to music was uh, my grandfather's mechanic little black man mm -hmm. named mr lou 
I was an annoying typical five year old getting into trouble. Right. And uh, didn't quite know what to do with me. So he handed me a harmonica and he'd sit there and with his guitar, had me listening to all kinds of old music. I probably spent the first five years of my life not realizing he was black or anything or the music was special. I just fell in love with it, that mm -hmm. beating the blues. Uh, later on, I played a little bit of piano. Um, I didn't stick to it, unfortunately. Yeah. You know, but that, but my first real music career experience came uh, much later um, when I was in my teens. Uh, Stone Pony was a pretty popular place in New Jersey. Mm -hmm. I grew up in New Jersey, so my first real music exposure was watching people like Bruce Springsteen. Oh, um, cool! Uh, watching the whole Jersey so, music scene. So you were you were born in New Jersey, and I, then you went I'm, to I'm Albuquerque. Yeah, you know, I was born in Hartford, Connecticut. Oh, Short okay. stories that mom and dad didn't quite make it home that night from grandma's house. I would have been born in Asbury Park, New Jersey. Oh, yeah, okay. You know. So raised. In Asbury Park, New Jersey. I'd like to say I was born in New Jersey. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's fine. I mean, that works for the stage. Uh, so, so you were born in New Jersey. Yeah. Wink. Yeah. And, and, uh, and then, so uh, how long did you stay in New Jersey? And that's where you picked up harmonica? I, I was uh, harmonica. there until like um, my early 20s. With the explosion of music scene, um, being New Jersey Asbury Park music scene. Um, so I got to watch Bruce Springsteen, Southside Johnny, Nasbury Park Jukes. I got to watch the beginnings of Bon Jovi, what it become, um, which became, we all know, Mega Rock later on down the line. Right. Um, guys like Cadillac Bob that you, you know, would, which are like minor stars. Um, mm -hmm. There's just so much music that came out in that time period. It was, it was Becoming friends with people like Vinny Mad Dog Lopez and hanging out in a place called Kingston and picking his head about music. Yeah. And people are like, wow, you knew the first drummer of E Street Band. I'm like, nah, it's just Vinny. He was all right. Right. In fact, <laughs> he's still around. He's still a hell of a golf player. If you're ever in New Jersey, you will get your ass kicked playing golf with Vinny. <laughs> yeah. Um, I actually, uh, it's, it's funny you hear the, 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 other habits of rock stars because you think that all they do day and night is play music uh, but i remembered hearing um from my cousin who when he was a dj in uh detroit he got to interview and play golf with uh les claypool and he said that uh les claypool is about a, a a par form golfer you know par golfer so that's uh, that's always fun to hear or, you know people who like i think les also fishes and you know stuff like that is good it uh it, uh, it uh, really influences their music i think the the other stuff that they do alongside their the music so so the first real yeah. professional experience came um i was uh about 15 16 years old everybody knows who buddy rich was at one point right pretty famous guy mm -hmm. you know heck of a drummer uh it has quite a reputation behind him at the time, I was going by my name, Teresa, you know, I'm, you know, they were mom sneaking into Stone Pony with my brother to watch the band. <laughs> uh, well, at this point, Buddy had his full extravaganza with him, not just his, you know, four or five piece. He had the whole thing, congas player, horn players. Right. At this point, I've been dabbling in drums and playing congas quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Still doing the harmonica thing. This harmonica comes in another story. Sure. Dogs. Anyways, we gotta love dogs. They wake you up in the morning. Oh yeah. As far as the Congress, anyways, the guy couldn't play it at night for whatever reason. Let's just say alcohol was involved and couldn't quite make oh, the man. stage. That's too bad. Buddy Rich is quite famous for not keeping us cool or really oh, yeah. expressing how Blowing he feels about how things are going. I'm gonna, out. I'm gonna go let the beast loose real sure. quick. We have a dog break coming up here, so just hold on. You know, we're gonna make sure these guys don't overshadow the show. Yeah. And it's a bright Sunday morning here in Colorado Springs. It's probably warmer here right now than most of the nation. Mm. You wouldn't think in the middle of February we'd have bright sunny skies and weather pushing the 50s. Anyways, back to Charlie and what we're doing here. <laughs> <laughs> well, right, anyways, just... he couldn't play. So, uh, yelling around, and we needed somebody to fill in for the Congress. <laughs> <laughs> Come on down and say hi to me this morning. There you go. Uh, let's go so this is Ned and this is Bernie. They, so, they're on the uh, podcast. My brother said, "Hey, my kid sister can play. He just needs to get through the show." Right. So puts me on the stage. I got to play the drums, and uh, I probably would have ended up playing a lot more with Mr. Rich, but 
at the end of the night, he goes, good kid, you get ready to pack up and pack for the tour for the next four months. I said, well, that's fine, but you have to ask my mom, I'm still in high school. But oh, it right did lead on. to me getting into my own band later after oh, that. Oh, very so cool. So that was how my music career, I decided I really loved the stage at that moment. Wow, I really want to do this. And it was really, in a, from a 15-year-old's perspective, I said, wow, this is what I want to do with the rest of my life is play music or do some form of art, which is the other thing I do. So you, you got a uh, so you got a, a, a personal sort of a affirmation or a recommendation from yeah. from Buddy Rich, and then that that led you to joining up uh, joining with a band. You said yeah, and that and was at the the red the Red Rockers in New Jersey. Was a, a couple friends of mine, you know, which we called ourselves Offset Blues. Um, we did an EP. Like you did a time period back then, you don't you don't get to burn things on a disc back in the eighties, man. It didn't happen. Right. You had the wheel to wheel on the big fat tape machine, mm -hmm. and the quality sucked. You know? <laughs> and you sat there and you went around with your friends passing out flyers. Social media today is really really helpful today. You guys are really really lucky to have that, because you don't have to work as hard to get people to come to your shows. Or maybe you do. It's just a different format to add with that. Mm -hmm. um, but making music is really much easier. You can sit down with your band, you clean, you can clean your space, you can have two songs cut in two days, whereas then you know, it's back and forth, back and forth. You know? Right. Oh yeah. yeah. So, so, yeah. so Offset Blues, you you cut an EP. Did it have a title? We did all right. You know, we did the local music scene. Our big thing is um, we split kind of went our own ways as we went into college you know some of mm -hmm. us got married this is where um i entered a turkish music scene for this part of cool. my life and um i stayed there for almost 15 years uh i still do blues on the side of jam nights and things like that but mm -hmm. this was my bread and butter i also um i had kids and family and got married the whole nine yards so that made it conducive being that at that point it's like i could be a musician mom and and I could go teach school twenty a day, you know, which right. is what I did for my profession. Um, I'm no longer a teacher. I'm semi-retired from that profession at this time. Oh, cool. What? what so when did you uh, when did you start teaching? Uh, I started I started teaching uh, oh back in 1999. So I mean, I and came went into early retirement thanks to life and cancer, but which I beat the cancer. Oh, but congrats! Fortunately, life is expensive when you need to take care of these things. So right change of profession is in in process to photography mm -hmm. <laughs> so so we're uh in in 99 where were you teaching yeah i used to teach seventh grade uh eighth grade it was a really good time i used to teach in history mm -hmm. um that was my favorite subject so i embraced it because i think history it's really important to know where you came from and what, what's going on. Mm -hmm. When I can get into an argument or a debate or a discussion, whatever people wish to call it today, changing history is not good. Our kids don't have anything to look back on. Mm -hmm. uh, as a teacher, I sit here, I have to cringe and look at the current system or what's going on and going, you know, that's not why we had, you know, we had the Civil War, et cetera. You know, some right. of the topics that kids are taught in school. Mm -hmm. I like nothing better than sitting down and finding the facts and pointing them out to people and working together so we don't repeat these things. Unfortunately, sure. We're in that situation right now with life. Do you think that history is bound to repeat itself no matter what, or do you think that it can be changed? Uh, say that part again. Do you think that uh, history is bound to repeat itself, or do you think yeah, it can be changed? Yeah, that's what I'm afraid is happening. And I, I know a lot of friends uh, I have, especially kids, you know, people in your age group. You guys were kids I kind of taught at one point. Um, and you guys are now the, the forefront funding adults. You know, I'm in my ah, 50s. You guys oh, are in your shit. 30s. And it's the things that you guys were taught are real important now. And if they weren't taught correctly... Like you take, you look at World War II and we look at the situations going now. No, they're not the same people. But there are certainly some scenarios that are repeating itself. And I'm wondering how, were we, were any of us paying attention to our history? Because we're about ready to hit some very hard times in the world and we're in the middle of them already. I wonder a lot of times if uh, when people read history, uh, it's, uh, you know, the uh, something written down on a piece of paper, factual or otherwise, yeah read by a thousand different people can be uh, interpreted a thousand different ways at a thousand different moments in the day. So what do you do with that? Like, you know, it's, it's some, some people are going to interpret, uh, 
sent, you know, uh, facts or things that they hear uh, different ways than than other people. And so some people can some people can see the the rise of Hitler as a as sort of like a, a blueprint to exercise your quote unquote right to shoot up a classroom or something like that. Um, or some people could see it as, you know, an atrocity that, you know, uh, we should learn from, uh, and that should never repeat itself. And, uh, you know, how do you, what, how do you, how do you address, uh, kids that would interpret something like the rise of Hitler in a, in a positive manner? Like, I'm sure that you ran into stuff like that a, a lot. That's a very, when very valid point there, Charlie, because um, it's the same thing. We all have to be our own investigator. Like, we get something. We, we should question it. We mm -hmm. should ask. <clears throat> we should have our own perception. But just to accept it as stone-cold fact just because so-and-so says it is, mm -hmm. that doesn't set well with me, and I don't think it should set well with the, with the individual. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And we have to, we're all going to have our own different ideas of what it should be. But we all have at least one base foundation. You know, um, there is a right and wrong. Most of us do have it. Sure. And it's just, a, it's the gray area is about where do we, where do we balance that out? And right. It's always going to go on in life, unfortunately. Well, and there, yeah, I think that, uh, you know, back when we were living in caves, the right yeah. and wrongs were pretty much based on uh, hunger and survival. And, um, and as, as we got more, uh, advanced to uh, technologically and ideologically <laughs> and uh, yeah, exactly. the uh, theologically um or theologically because you we, get the perception of, a, of someone who actually lives through the time period versus the person who has to learn about it mm -hmm. they're going to be two different perceptions always right yeah. well you think there's there's a time when uh when you could shoot somebody for uh for, for robbing your, your household, right. you know, uh, and, and that was, that was a, a right back when that was okay to do. And now it's, and now it's a wrong, which I have mixed feelings about because mm -hmm. if you're going to come into my house in my space, mm -hmm. shouldn't I have a right to protect myself. Now all of a sudden we have these laws and mm -hmm. questions. Um, this brings us to what we're in the middle of right now, these shootings, you know, mm -hmm. and as a teacher, I'm seeing this. Should we arm the teachers? Should we take away the guns? Should we, you know, put more gun control? God, I have so many swirling ideas. One, one thing I can say, we haven't, the one thing that's not getting looked at is the problem what resulted in these people picking up the gun in the first place right yeah what what made them uh what put that the anger in their heart to make them want to shoot everybody in the first place right. there's a reason and that, that that's the one thing i'm not hearing about is that reason mm -hmm. they're, they're trying to make him a white supremacist or he's with isis or he's with mm -hmm. no there's a reason you yeah know? The, you know somebody uh you know i i i I, sometimes I feel like a lot of people that comment on this stuff on Facebook are, are trying to get uh, some kind of trending traffic to their page. But uh, one one interesting thing that I did see was uh, somebody posted a comment or somebody posted an article about uh, a, a knife attack that happened in China in 2014. Right. And there was about, I, I think it said like 30 dead and 119 wounded in a knife fight. And uh, his comment, you know, it was a little tongue in cheek, but I, it, it was amusing to me. Uh, he said, how come nobody's talking about knife control? <laughs> oh, it, it, it's you know, the opinions that you see in Facebook when mm -hmm. it first came around. It used to be great. I, I, I found my friend from the third grade. This is so cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, now it's like, um, uh, we're talking about the president and how he um, tweets and how much it costs for him to get that spray paint tan and right. <laughs> wow and who wore it better his wife with a shower with a shower curtain I mean right. guys I mean we're all, we've gotten to the point where I worry about are we losing the ability to have a conversation with each other because you talk to your friend he sends you a gif or mm -hmm. a meme and you're like you get it it's it makes sense but. Sometimes you want their opinion. <laughs> you right. really want to say, hey, what's going on? Right. So like things like this radio show, we're having a conversation talking about our various opinions and getting to know each other a little better here. Right. And it's so important people not to lose that because, man, if the internet or all of it were to go boom tomorrow, right. 
how many of you guys would be able to go out and go, hi, my name is Bob. You know, what's, it go- what's right. going on? You know? Yeah. I, uh, I, I, I say this a lot. Uh, you know, and I, um, I believe it to be true. If we, if none of us had access to the information that we have access to now, if all we had were the books that we have in, in our house, uh, what would your political opinion be then? You know, like if, if you weren't, uh, basically if your, if your television got shut off, if your internet got shut off, you weren't being fed a constant stream of, uh, of perhaps, you know, formulated a pre-formulated opinion on one side or the other, what would your political opinion be? And, um, I think that short circuits a lot of people's arguments because they, uh, you know, I, I think if you if you take Trump out of the equation, because you know, say even twenty twenty five years ago, people people didn't have Facebook, they didn't have Google, so they couldn't fact check or have conversations uh, that were so readily available. Uh, excuse me, conversations that the facts were so readily available. Um, so they actually had to think about what their their opinions were beyond just what happened in the news. And the other thing that I think is happening is that Facebook has given everybody in the world a voice. And so they feel the need to express their, uh, their voice, no matter what, like I, I don't express myself uh, (laughs) politically very often because I feel that I'm not very intelligent when it comes to politics. So I just kind of take a giant step back and sort of let the the uh the cat fighting happen <laughs> i wouldn't word yourself like that at all i just think you have a viewpoint and you work with, with set things that, that are important to you so it may not be the same as somebody who's sitting on capitol hill but doesn't mean your viewpoint isn't just as valid i see you as the working individual who's out there in the masses every single day who has more of a street viewpoint of what's going on so maybe you don't know the checks and balances like they do but are there checks and balances really what's really going on or is that stuff that they're, that they're pulling from a statistical math that they've had to learn to become what they are because sometimes when you're on the street you get to see what's really going on and that is a valid perspective that that, that they have lost so sometimes it takes both perspectives to really get some things to be changed and move forward for you know improvement in people problem is people we take a really long time making that decision <laughs> right yeah we and uh what's uh you know uh, are there universal goods and bads uh, are there like are there things that are um like we were talking well you were saying that everybody kind of basically has a right and a wrong and uh i i you know my my biggest uh the the hardest time that i have with government is who who is in charge of that right and wrong and uh uh, there's uh do you know who joe rogan is the comedian he talks about how the the president was a good idea when there was about 300 people in america total and now there's there's what like three billion people in the country and and how do you pick one person who's in charge of all that like to make to make the the one right decision to make every single person happy because the, I mean, the the thing that I've observed is that from in every cycle of four years, there's one group of people that's happy, one group of people that's upset, and the uh, the vitriol is growing on both sides, and and the uh, the line uh, uh, the lines of division are getting broader and broader, and I think that there's more and more people that are finding themselves in the middle, not so much thinking about politics as a sport you know kind of like us versus them and and thinking about it more of just like well let's let's put this issue on the table and talk about that versus the you know because i honestly i I mean i as evidenced by the fact that donald trump is in the white house right now i don't think that the presidency or the i don't think that the president is any more a position to be taken seriously like at all yeah you go back to somebody like um Let's go FDR back to World War II. The guy was a real president in my book. I mean, I wasn't there, but the things, what I see and read, and I really have torn apart that time period in history, talking to elder people who were there Mm -hmm. during that time period and getting their viewpoint of what he was like as president to the current politics we have now. Um, You know, 
he was more qualified for the job, in my opinion, based on what we're looking at today. Whereas, now I'm not saying Donald Trump doesn't have some abilities to be a businessman, but and I question the ability of the president because he um, didn't have the military foundation. He didn't have the political political background that everybody else seems to have to mm -hmm. become president. So there, I spent this last year, and how do we put a businessman in mm -hmm. office? I mean, a guy who find running casinos or... or or ch chain strip malls and things like that, so, or even real estate, but the country. So I sit here in bafflement. How is we have taken the country, which is people, our jobs, our health care, everything we're doing. We're not real estate. We're, we're not We're not a casino. We're not a strip mall. So you know, I, uh, I honestly don't think that, uh, that Donald Trump thought he was going to win. Yeah. My my opinion uh, is that he won or he he ran one of the the best and most efficient campaigns in the history of anybody running for president based on the fact that he thought that there was not not a snowball's chance in hell that he was going to get in. So, he <laughs> he shot he shot his mouth off. He he hyped up. I mean he he was in my opinion he was at, he was playing the character of the. Uh, the quote unquote disenfranchised white Republican, you know, he was really like, and it's your right to have the guns. And, and, uh, you know, he, he really just was, uh, was playing that role. And I think that he thought that he was going to run so hard in that direction against a, uh, against somebody who was more of a, um, uh, in the eyes of the media, a popular, uh, candidate like Hillary Clinton, and I think that he knew that that was that it was going to come down come down to him and Hillary. I don't think he thought in a million years he was going to win. I think that he was going to um, run a ridiculous campaign, which ended up being, like I said, the best right. and most efficient. And it was, I think, what he thought it was going to be was it was going to be the like the ending chapter in his memoir, like I was almost the president, and and it kind of like the final episode of The Apprentice, <laughs> right? Yeah. Well, he, I, I think what it was, what what he was trying to do was was have like a a crowning achievement in his life yeah. that which would have been like, oh, and I was almost president, and I would have gotten away with it too if it hadn't been for those meddling kids and their and their dog, you know, that kind of a mentality. And then when he got in into the White House, I think that there was a serious oh shit, what the what the fuck do I do? I do you know. know. <laughs> uh, and the thing is, well, I don't think people were counting on when he had Bernie and Hillary when they were during the Democratic campaign. I don't think anyone really counted on the momentum that Bernie Sanders had picked up amongst the people. Sure. And then when it came down to two, that Democrat Democratic Party didn't look hard enough to see what the people wanted at that point. I'm not saying I'm either for or against Hillary or Bernie. I just think um, that crucial decision is what led to Donald being president right now. Well, I uh, at the, uh, now, after seeing some of the things that Bernie's done, after having sort of uh, slunk back into the, the shadows of being just a congressperson, uh, I... I used to say, man, I would have loved to have seen a, a Bernie versus Donald uh, campaign, uh, you know, a Bernie Sanders versus Donald Trump campaign. I think that I think that not only would have Bernie Sanders beaten Donald Trump by a landslide, but I think that he would have at the time I thought that he would have represented a lot, a bigger majority of what everybody wanted to see versus the more polarizing Hillary versus Donald Trump. Uh, thing that we got to see but now I think that Bernie was there as a distraction and I think that he was sort of in Hillary's pocket the the entire time and he just sort of he like he ran a, a, a successful uh, sort of distraction and then uh, and then turned it over to Hillary once he got like enough support and I think that turned a lot of people off to Bernie that turned a lot, a lot of people off to Democrats, uh, the idea of Democrats and Republicans, politics in general. It's it's certainly got people thinking third party with the, with the capital with the capital to be here, you know. Mm -hmm. um, matter of fact, when it came down to the end, when I voted, it was third party for me. I need I knew it wasn't going to make a difference in the end, but 
I, I, my conscience couldn't go either way with these people when it came down to the well, end. Well, I'm, I'm about to out myself, but I, I have many times already, but I, uh, I'm not registered to vote mostly because of, I don't want to be called for jury duty. And uh, I, the other reason is I don't vote for the same reason that I don't participate in fantasy football because I don't think that, like, you participating in fantasy football doesn't uh, have a direct effect on the outcome. And I don't think that, uh, I honestly don't think that voting has a direct effect on the outcome because if, if, all, if one side was completely right and the other side was completely wrong, we would have, like, a slew of Democratic presidents or a slew of Republican presidents. And I think that a lot of this shit is pre-engineered so that people feel as though they're contributing when in fact it's just a big distraction to keep people uh, sort of unmotivated, you know, and, and just sort of invested in something that doesn't really matter, like the presidency, if that I makes sense. I do think when it comes to 2020, people are really going to be paying attention to this next one. Oh, yeah. Uh, whether or not, who's coming in. I mm -hmm. mean, I think we really all need to pay attention because, um, what, you know, times right now, I mean, you go out, you go to a grocery store, you take a $20 bill, you're going to go get yourself a few things for your house. You can give me four things. Right. That's it. Mm -hmm. And that's really looking. Gallon of milk. Oh, you, you got yourself a $5 meal, some paper towels, and and something, and something some coffee. There's your 20 bucks. Right. Now, you take that same 20 bucks, go back to 1985, mm -hmm. you fill up half a shopping cart. Who is yeah. a? Uh, I'm it sorry. Really like I, like, like I said, I'm I'm dumb. But who is president in, in 1985? Well, 85. Well, we had Ronnie in there. It was a mess because it was. We're coming out of the 70s. I was a child of the 70s, so I didn't really have the politics going on. But I do remember um, somebody asked me, "Were the 70s that cool?" I'm gonna have to say, "Yeah, I was mm -hmm. old enough to tell you it was that cool." Mm -hmm. um, it yeah, I feel the same way about the 90s. You know, Ronnie came into office and we suddenly started having this big war for oil, which started way back then, guys. You mm -hmm. know, we put the Taliban in place. We put Saddam in power, which led to this, all this big mess we have. It all started when Jimmy Carter became president, the hostage crisis. The reality is, I think, really, Jimmy was about ready to make the country a better place with um, uh, renewable energy, um, talked about in 76 legalizing um, cannabis and hemp for, um, you know, cannabis for medical reasons, hemp for uh, uh, for production for reasons, everything. for everything. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, and everybody was really laid back at this point. I mean, if you take somebody like your parents or grandparents and talk to them, ask them what it was like in 76, they'll tell you it was hard times. We had gas prices. We had the same issues we do with work, but not to the extremities we did today. For example, um, you go get a job today, and employer could decide after three days and want you. It was a little hard to get rid of you back then, because chances are you got hired, you worked for a union. You know how many people work for a union today? Not not too many. Back then, right. you worked for a union, so you couldn't just get fired if you were doing your job. Mm -hmm. You know, Today, you go work for um, a, um, a deli or something. Well, we decided we're going to hire someone else because whatever. Why? What? Because they look better, whatever. They don't <laughs> right. have to give you a reason in Colorado. Right. <laughs> Is, are there are there other states that have more uh, more lenient or better laws than Colorado? I would think New Jersey. When I lived there, mind you, it's been a long time. New Jersey's, you know, screen seemed to screen a little better for candidates. Now, Oregon. Uh, when I worked in Oregon. It was more word of mouth. It seemed like everybody helped each other get a job. No, mm, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Maybe it was just, and that was only five years ago, mind you. Uh, what do you do? Well, I do that, this. Uh, I do. I, I cook this, or I run a house cleaning company, or I'm a drywaller. Oh, really? You should talk to uh, so and so on A Street. You know, Colorado Springs. It seems like everyone's really friendly. But you need a job? Go to the job resource center and get on the internet and hope to God they call you back. Mm -hmm. Right? <laughs> uh, have you heard, have you heard of uh, Fiverr? I think it's uh, I think it's called Fiverr dot com. No, I haven't. You uh, you put your services up for a minimum of five bucks. It's called Fiverr, <laughs> nice. you know. <laughs> and uh, and so yeah, a lot of people are finding or like uh, Etsy. A lot of people are finding different ways to sell their their art and wares on the internet, and that's a the, that's one way of uh you know being independent of uh just getting a, a job and 
you know, the system. <laughs> well, as far as work right now, I'm also playing music and I, I do work with a group called Helping Angels, which helps with um, homeless and veterans. They're, cool. they're not the same as Blackbird Outreach, but they're another group. We mostly gather clothing, food, help them find resources, get them to and from rides to doctor's appointments when, um, because a lot of these emergency services, if you don't have, if you don't have Medicaid or you're not on assistance, they won't come get you. But there's a lot of these people who are in process of getting assistance. So we're, we have like, um, you know, angels that'll come take you to and from your DA appointment. And, um, cause we all fall on hard times out here. So, right. you know, th this group I work with, it's just to help each other out. So, we can all get by, you know, you know, I do Sunday morning distribution food boxes from, you know, eight to 10 in the morning down off a of galley. And uh, so if anybody ever really needs any help and needs any information on resources, I'm willing to share that with anyone because we all need a helping hand from time to time. Right. So not, not a, not a very professional segue, but uh, let's talk about your, uh, your, your, so we, we, uh, we got about halfway through your, uh, musical career you you had uh, gotten the yeah we kind of got sidetracked and everything oh it's okay but I I, uh, I I just saw that we uh were about at the halfway mark um and but I wanted to uh I wanted to talk about your upcoming projects and you were talking about the electric mayhem well yeah electric mayhem uh, it's a really exciting project it's a it's a new funk and blues <clears throat> band here in Colorado Springs um um we're we we had our first show at uh, peak 31 on February 3rd we have another show on March 10th at the Ancient Mariner uh, for Hip Hop and Funk Night. I hope you all come down and be a part of it. It's a free show, so we really like to see everyone there. I mean, the songs we do, we bring back the 70s and early 80s to you. I mean, if you like Car Wash and uh, Rick right James, give it to me, baby. <laughs> We're going to give you that. We're gonna, we, so uh, yeah. so who all is in Electric Mayhem? Right now, we have our, our lady singer. Her name is Starla Cop. We have on bass, uh, Dennis Spencer. On drums, we have Jimmy the Beast Siler, and on uh, guitar, we have Dress Strasserman, and on percussion, we have Kevin Dunn, myself playing uh, harmonica, backing vocals, and, and, you know, that's pretty much Electric Mayhem. Yeah. Cool. So did, did you start Electric Mayhem? No, no. Actually, Jeff Strasserman is the manager of uh, Electric Mayhem, and but he, he's we the are, guitar like, player. all together. We all have say what's going on. Um and we're still looking for a keyboard player so if any of you guys play keyboards and want to play funk come find us we're right looking on. for you so um so it, you said it's josh stress stressman or jeff stressman jeff, jeff so, so, so he jeff also plays with earsome and right now those guys are rocking it in uh uh omaha nebraska oh cool yeah so you know here seeing our local guys make it out and travel is really really cool especially mm -hmm. when they're they're bandmates of yours and in their other project he that's a original metal project so if you want to check them out you know there's some also plays quite a bit here in colorado springs cool so w did he already have uh yes rim going but when he started electric it, it, was, it all came to pass how that project came to pass was we all became friends. We all go to various jam nights. Mm -hmm. There's a jam night that happens at Rocks. Before that was at Peak 31 called White Trash Superstars, mm -hmm. which is a jam of just collective musicians that get together, hosted by Dave Way. Mm -hmm. um, and we just hang out and get to know each other. And people find out what they play and start talking. And then we start jamming on the side. I uh, met a guy named uh, Greg Benson at that time, named uh, who had a band called Sergeant Sergeant. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, which was original country rock, which was myself, uh, Greg Benson, Christine Pierce on drums, Joe Fitzgerald, and I don't remember the basis his last name, but his first name was Dave. He he was a friend of Greg's from um, Denver, and for a little while we got together for about eight months, tried it out, and. Um, Greg had some personal stuff that happened, so we had to mm -hmm. disband the time, and that project is on high hitters. It's really too bad, because I will say Greg Benson wrote some fabulous songs, man. Yeah. And there is some of this stuff that's up on YouTube that you, know, you can check it out or go to Sergeant Sergeant's um, music page. And Christine Pierce, you know, there's a story about her. I mean, she's a fabulous drummer and now plays with River Bottom, and we touch base, still jam quite a bit mm -hmm. together, so... You know, everyone I've met in this community is really great. Jeff Strasserman was watching that band at that time with Earsom because we were playing a showcase together mm -hmm. over at the playing field, ho hosted by a mantle Gentile at the time. And thought, wow, Jeff, 
and then came up and approached me and said, hey, I'm thinking about putting together another project. We tried out some different people. It didn't quite work out. The, the names I'd listed is what Gerald to become, Electric Mayhem. Mm -hmm. Our original drummer was Zach Carey, but he went on to do a band called Paper House and a production company. Mm -hmm. He's still out there, so go ahead and check him out as well. Sure. Dennis Spencer plays with another band called Eastern Storm. You know, so Dennis everybody's Spencer's... got all kinds of stuff going okay, on. Okay, so uh, Jeff, Jeff on guitar, right? Yeah, so, so he brought us all together. Cool. And so yeah. did he sort of, did he hit you guys up individually one at a time, or did was it, was it all just sort of he brought everybody together in one room at yeah. one time? Yeah, and then he asked me how I felt about playing funk, and I said, funk with harmonica, hmm. Uh, then we started watching some YouTube videos, and all these songs where harmonica can duplicate. So I can play in several. You know, I can play in the second and the third position. Third position it brings in a lot of that horn sound, mm -hmm. and I could duplicate in some <clears throat> cases the sound of two horns, like a sax and a trumpet at once, uh, fulfilling two roles. Now mm -hmm. I also play trumpet. You know, I mean, I'm not saying it won't work its way into this project. It will as it, as it, as we're going along. And uh, but it's you can't play two instruments at once. Sometimes like you're doing <laughs> celebration. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'll sit there and do the parts, work it in with the harmonica, with the backing vocals, uh, and it, like I said, it's it, so it's coming together. I mean, if you close your eyes and you listen to us play, we, we sound like something you pull up in your old skating rink or the disco or you have a little fun. I cool. really love it when people start dancing because we brought back happy memories. Cool, Jeff. Just foresaw this and saw it as there's not enough of funk in Colorado Springs, and we agreed with them, and so we got on board. Right on. Uh, other than uh, Sugar Bear and the Showtime Band, who else is really out there doing that kind of vein of music? And we figured there's room, there's room, and I love Sugar Bear. As a matter of fact, he put on a heck of a show last night. If anybody mm -hmm. caught that over at Stargazers, so um, got to study my competition. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, yeah, Sugar Bear has got a good show. Um, so yeah, you guys are doing, uh, 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 is it all original funk music? Well, right now it's covers, but we are going to start writing some stuff as we go into summer of our own stuff. Um, we're really excited about it because all of us can write a little bit of music. All mm. of us have the willingness to do this. So, and as soon as we do that, we have every intention of, um, putting it out, out on the air like KCOS and Colorado Phil and YouTube, Reverb Nation, Spotify. I guess there's so many others I can be here naming various um, radio stations where you can put your music on. So yeah, that you is can also uh, <laughs> you go on CD Baby and you pay like uh, 90 bucks. You get uh, digital distribution and uh, get all your stuff on iTunes and Spotify, Pandora, all that stuff. Yeah. And it's a, it's a really good... Uh, it's a really good way to get you, you know, spread your music out. And the uh, the only the only pain in the ass part, the part that I'm dealing with right now, is trying to figure out if I want to do ASCAP or BMI because that's how you end up getting uh, royalties when you hit a certain amount. But know? in a matter of time, as far as officially being out there playing, we've only been out since February third. Formed only in, in the last four, three four months. Mm -hmm. I think we're on a really good direction. We do have a Facebook page up. We are growing. There are photographs that are going to be coming really soon in video uh, from Kevin Moore. You guys, uh, <laughs> you guys worried at all about getting a, a cease and desist from Dr. Teeth? Uh, yeah, we get a lot of that. <laughs> I think um, we're trying to figure out who's Dr. Teeth. I, sometimes we look at Jeff, we're all funny. He could be him. Um, well, we do got, we don't have animal, but we have the bees. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Right on. <laughs> uh, so, uh, and yeah, we put, we'll cultivate, you know, personalities on stage, you know. Uh, our whole thing is to really just bring happiness to everybody. And yeah, some of the covers are important. And yes, we want to bring original funk in, into the scene because there isn't anybody really doing it. It is fun music. And, um, and Territory Days is something we're hoping to be seeing at this summer. We put in our packets, so um, keep cool. our fingers crossed. They like what they hear, and we'll be funking, funking out on the streets of Colorado Springs. So very cool. <laughs> yeah, Territory Days is always fun. Uh, it's too bad it uh, it almost always happens the same time as um, Meadowgrass out in La Forêt. The the oh. two festivals kind of happen on the same couple of days. Uh, that's that's more of like a like a bluegrass, like um, let's see, they well they bring some people. Like last year, we got to open up for 
uh, Joan Osborne out there. Oh wow! Um, I really like Joan Osborne. I cover one of her songs quite a bit. So. Well, actually, well, she was. It was a neat set because she. It was uh, an acoustic guitar player herself singing and a uh, piano player, and she was playing tambourine, and she was doing all uh, Bob. She well, she was getting ready to release a record that was all Bob Dylan tunes. And so she did the majority of Bob Dylan uh, songs that night. And then she also did, you know, her, her mega hits. And then uh, they shut the main tent down and then everybody filed into this uh, this little cabin. Or not little cabin, it was sort of like a, a, a mess hall out in La Forêt. And um, I got to play with Milo Hayes Meld and uh, do the, the closing party. So that, that was, uh, I do know Electric Mayhem was open to playing just about anywhere that will be welcome and yeah. you know, family friendly festivals, parties, you know, casinos, I, really any place where that people want to dance. That's where we want to be. You know? Yeah, that's uh, it's hard sometimes to get people dancing in Colorado Springs. <laughs> sometimes they don't want to move. They just want to. Well, just wanna... luckily we'll dance with you if that gets you going. You know, not, yeah, I love, really love our lady singer Starla and myself. We're not afraid to go out there and engage the crowd and let Starla them tell them. Cobb. It's okay. Uh, I feel like I, oh, I know her. I met her um, back when I was uh, still playing bass with Ryan Flores. Um, we played this library show. We played a show at the, the actually the library that's just over here. And Starla was in the audience. And, uh, you know, it's funny. I, 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 uh, I don't even think she told me that she sang. I don't know if she was... I don't know if she was singing back then or, or, or what, but yeah, that's so funny. Throughout the course of us talking right now, I just uh, got the mental picture and uh, realized who, who it was you were talking about. <laughs> so that's cool. I do want to give some special mention to Teddy Galloway because if it wasn't for Teddy Galloway to put me on stage with Big Sky when mm -hmm. I first got here, I didn't know anyone's name. Right. Not even what Benny's was. Right. And he put me on stage to play harmonica because he had heard me play and that's led to meeting the rest of you. So, you know, yeah, Teddy, Teddy Galloway may be just quiet. Man. No, he's not so quiet. I mean, <laughs> this little guy just plays with Big Sky. He knows everything. You know, just <laughs> keep right. an eye out for Teddy. Oh, Thank yeah, you, he's Teddy. a good guy. <laughs> Teddy's a great guy. Actually, uh, for a while, I was um, I was teaching Teddy's grandson, uh, Nacho, uh, guitar lessons. And he's a fabulous little guitar player, so it must be in, oh, the, in wow. the genes. And then uh, Ignacio's father, um, Teddy's, what would that be? Teddy's son-in-law. Uh, that his name is, uh, or his stage name is Ivy Hustles, and he's a rapper in the local okay, community. So we got yeah. to we got to perform at the same show uh, on Thursday. We opened up for Murs at the Black Sheep. So that was that was fun. So the Galloways are, are always. And I think I think his uh, his daughter Shannon sings as well, so. And James is up and coming. You know. Oh yeah, that goes without saying. James yeah. James is his own all all his own entity. He's a, he's a special guy. He played um, mandolin on our our last record, uh, on a few songs, and so it was a uh, it was fun to work with him. Um, actually, uh, my my original intention was to cut an album with all the. Uh, barrel house string guys uh when they were still a unit and uh i got all of them recorded except for uh uh adrian because they were just a three-piece at the time just bass ma uh, mandolin and guitar so i got the guitar player and the mandolin uh, caleb and james recorded and um yeah their stuff uh their stuff sounded great and it just it just kind of sat around for uh, a year and I just said well let's just put this on an album and it ended up going on the latest thing that we put out so well not like the latest thing but the latest like official like packaged CD that we put out so yeah but James James is great I love uh, his solo stuff and his uh, duet with Samantha the High Mountain duet that's a that's a really great project have you heard them just one question I wanted to ask you. There was a fabulous jam you were running called the, um, you know, Electric Church. Yeah. I really liked it. I, unfortunately, it fell on Sunday. Uh, when Electric Mayhem came together, that's when I practiced on Sundays. And finally, we got the time switched to later, and I could go to Electric Church, and now mm -hmm. church is gone. <laughs> yeah, church isn't going anymore, at least at the Mariner. We're uh, we're thinking about, um, about uh, 
rehashing it as a uh, reappearing, a disappearing, reappearing turtle sort of thing. So it, it would pop up in uh, various different locations. Um, that could be a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. And if you could get us on board, we'd love to support you. Basically, having the uh, traveling electric church would be really cool because it would allow all of us to become a part of part of your congregation as i would right. say oh yeah electric church is a lot of fun and uh the uh, the hardest part was sort of getting people to uh kind of lighten up because there's some people that could uh, i don't i mean you know that in colorado springs there's there's a blues jam and a metal jam basically if you if you close your eyes and, and throw a, a bottle cap in in one direction you'll hit a blues jam somewhere or you'll hit a metal jam somewhere so what I wanted to do is actually have like a a uh, instrumental, formless, shapeless kind of free form musical conversation, and there were some people that were still trying to come and play the blues, and uh, some people that were and and that and they were they were you know leaning over and talking shit about the people that were trying to you know get you know kind of break free of that and express themselves, and that was one thing that it was a. Uh, sort of frustrating for me as, as the, uh, the the host or leader of it was um, people would come up to me and say like, oh, you got to, you got to take that. You got to let that, you're going to tell that person that they suck or whatever and uh, tell them to get off stage. But when, when the idea was that literally anybody could get up and do anything at any time for, for any reason to, to borrow well, a zap of coin. Of music, I, I thought, I found that really exciting because it had let, for example, if you're playing a blues band, or you're playing a funk band, or you're playing a country band, that, 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 that's your pocket. Mm -hmm. For a moment, you can step out of your pocket and, and take your music to a new direction. You might discover something. One thing I've decided, if I, I, you start back up church, I'm going to bring my trumpet out to church because yeah, why not? it's something I don't get enough to do. Of, you know? Right. Yeah, uh, my girlfriend's uh, son Desi. He's uh, starting to play trombone, and, and we're uh, we're having little jam sessions uh, down here. And he's uh, he's picking it up. I'm I'm showing him uh, uh, Dennis Rollins, uh, fabulous jazz trombone player. And because uh, you know, there's a lot of you can there, you can point to a lot of um, trumpet sort of all stars for uh, for jazz, but there's not a lot of trombone. Uh, you know, beyond like Lee Dorsey and, and fusion. That's what I mm -hmm. don't really play. What I call true jazz. I play a lot of fusion though, mm -hmm. um, and I love getting together a good good set of horns behind behind yeah. a strong backbeat. You know. Do you have a favorite uh, fusion band that you like to listen to? I don't really have anybody. Well, I guess Mighty Boss Tones. When, when kind of, you know, I I really listen to a lot of them for a while. I wouldn't call them fusion, but they definitely tear apart a lot of everything. I mean, oh yeah. I mean, when I first started listening to horn sections, it would you really want to listen to one that just blow your mind to listen to James Brown's horn section. Holy crap! Oh yeah. They started all this crap where mm -hmm. you go on and where you go into funk. Parliament um, just takes it, people will call it funk, but I I think Parliament Parliament goes to the next mile. Um, as far as modern stuff, modern day people, um, you know, I listen to people like the Alabama Shakes, you know, I mean, sure. you know, uh, there's so, such a wide variety of people out there. Mm -hmm. I could be here for 10 hours just listening off. Hey, you need to check out this person. That <laughs> right. Person, you know? Yeah. Let's see. Speaking of the 10 hours. Oh, we got, uh, we got seven more minutes till we, till we hit the hour. Is there, is, so is there anything in, in, in conclusion that you want to you want to uh let people know about yourself about what it is that you do well, uh, your photography your harmonic playing well i do uh, uh you have your traditional photographers yeah i i, I can do traditional <clears throat> photography folks but my specialty is taking your photos and deliberately turning into like an art art format and out of the best ones i'm sometimes will be commissioned to paint that straight from my photo mm. so i i'm available to do photography for bands right now i'm really easy just give me like your t-shirt and let me into your show man i don't right. even just do photos for that because i know we're all trying to get ourselves out there second of all electric mayhem is looking for a keyboard player if you really do want to funk out with us have a lot of fun meet some cool people uh give me myself i just saw some in a call and we'll get you in touch and roll on in last come out and see us on march 10th you know at the ancient mariner and Charlie Milo is a heck of a guy. I'm really, really uh, thankful that he's my friend. And a um, little story behind Charlie. I first moved to town here. <laughs> locked my keys in my car, man. It was drag. <laughs> man, I didn't even know Charlie. Charlie didn't know me. Charlie walked up to me, had me ability to calm down. And 
And after that, we've been really good friends. He's one of the chillest dudes in this town. Not only is he a fantastic musician, he's a fantastic human being. Thank you for uh, being a part Terry. of the show. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I don't think there's anything, any way we can top that. So I think we'll just uh, we'll wrap it up from there. Terry, thank you so much for being on the show. And uh, come see Electric Mayhem on, uh, what is it, March March 10th, 10th at the Ancient Mariner, Ancient Manitou. Mariner, Manitou Springs. All right. We'll see you all later.